References. Reference. At least in this particular chapter's case, there is a moment in there which makes a lot of sense given the title, but it's also kind of one of the long-standing problems I have. Mm -hmm. We'll get there when we get there. For now, we got Psycho Paula. <laughs> this part I actually like. Well, there's not so much uh, darkness fuckery going around, if I remember right. One morning, I yeah. About a love -making. Also, hard confirmation during this that Garcia so loves putting his dick in crazy. Yeah. yeah. A practical joke, you know? Chicks love those. Paula was so angry, she grabbed a knife and chased me all over the apartment. And she is scary with a knife. No cool, bro! No cool! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just... I mean, there's a time and place for crazy, but you at least got to, like, communicate clearly that this is what you want to do. Yeah, if you make a joke and a girl, or guy, or whatever you prefer, responds with blades, not cool. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Unlo again, unless it's your thing, but you gotta, but you gotta make it clear that... Yeah. <laughs> Establish boundaries. Correctly ones that don't involve sharp instruments. Or maybe I'm just yes. screwed, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. But now we've got another Sisters Grimm fight. This this one slightly more annoying than the last one because this one likes to make doubles of herself or triples. Just uh, just any amount of copies. It gets especially crazy when she's about to go down. Gotta love those shadow clones. Someone on the development team was a big fan of Naruto, but it's not really a compliment, I don't think. No. But I'd also like to to think that the idea of Shadow Clones is at least more prevalent in things other than Naruto. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I'd like to give them more credit that they're pulling from, like, better inspirations than just the shitty anime. <laughs> Yeah, the problem with these boss fights is once you've seen, like, the... Well, the, the Sisters Grimm, if I remember right, they don't really do much other than this. Yeah. They're, they're pretty much one-trick ponies. Like, the... Yeah, because, like, it's very much the same thing where all of them require you to be in darkness in order to use the light shot on them. But, like, these first, uh, these first two are, like, so similar in how it's approached that like the last one is uh, I want to say off the top of my head was like more interesting probably because they yeah. knew that it was the last of the three but this is like it's basically the exact same as the first one it, but with the only difference being that she makes clones yeah and each version of it is the same but more of yeah like like this amount is completely fucking ridiculous now yeah that's bullshit like when you, like, like you look at stuff like the the Poe sisters in like any like the old Legend of Zelda games, like Ocarina of Time. There was that one, uh, of, like the last one you fought that basically like had four versions of her, but it never went more than four. Yeah, once yeah, once it gets to like more than I don't know half a dozen. Yeah. Unless it, unless it, you make it specifically easy to do. Or to, yeah. to, to mess them up, then it's like, why? Yeah, but... It just, just becomes oh, a well. busy work. At, at least I did not have that same level of, like, bumbling around like I did with the first uh, Sister Grimm fight. Yeah. <laughs> I think in that one as well, it was much easier to see the, the weak point. Because uh, the chest of the real one was glowing red. Yeah, it was. But now we got to get our blue gem that, you know, should have been there, but the darkness decided to just take it. We'll turn around for a second. Come on, come on, let, let more to the left. There we go. Yeah. Uh, 
I gotta love those teleporty dungeony things. Mm. Oh well. It, this part isn't too bad. Yeah, I was. I finished off. Uh, I've been playing through the Shin Megami Tensei games again. Mm -hmm. Their designers love teleport dungeons. Oh the yeah. Dungeon. They, they they could not get enough of playing wizardry back in like their college days, and were like, let's make this even more dickish. <laughs> yeah, the only thing that's missing is the spinny platforms that completely change your direction. Yeah. And once they do that, they'll have evolved to their final form, much like the teeth grinder. Yeah, a, a less elegant looking design, unfortunately, and this kind of brings up something that. I wish that there was a bit more nuance with, uh, just for the fact that they only have three weapon types. Yeah. I wish you could switch back and forth between, like, its regular and upgraded forms. Yeah, I, I like Because, the... yeah, I yeah. think there's there's more practic uh, practicality to be had with maybe, like, having just the regular teether if you want, like, a more controlled straight line of fire. Whereas this is, as, like, the as this is clearly meant to indicate, is a lot meant to be more for dealing with crowds if you don't feel like using the shotgun. Yeah, ironically, it's more like a shotgun than the shotgun. Kind of is, yeah. But without, you know, like, the the satisfying, like, you know, heavy shot and pump reload. Yeah. Now the, the standard teether is probably one of my favorite weapons in the game. The teeth grinder is just, like... It's a, it's a massive dentist drills that fire teeth. Yeah. Which, in theory, sounds fucking amazing. In practice, it's completely impractical. It is. And then, like, the and then like the next upgrade we get from the teeth grinder is even more ridiculous and just adds more to the, yeah, you know, just the design just being less cool in a weird way. Yeah. But here's something I forgot to mention with the pistol's alt fire, right, uh is that these are like the enemies you come across where you using you know like the you know like the gooey light shots is basically required because their armor is so thick yeah if you actually look at the armor it's got the sort of yellow cracks on it like the destructible environment types yep so it's a big hint what you should be doing mm-hmm but I like it. I mean, like, I think that alt fire alone, when you get it, is reason enough for why I still like the, you know, why I still like using the boner more than like the teether or any of its variants. Mm. Just because that is, I appreciate weapons that allow for versatility and like options of like firing modes and such. Mm. When it's just stuff like what the teether has, where it's it changes its primary function and gives you nothing else. It. It's kind of disappointing. Like, yeah. Like, j give me alt fires. Give me more alt fires and firing modes in any game that oh, has yeah. guns. Like, Doom Eternal's got that in spades, and they can change oh, yes. quite drastically once you get the uh, the masteries for them. <laughs> like, if you thought if you thought an energy shield on a Gatling gun was like too defensive of an idea for a game like that, wait until you upgrade it so that you can just project the shield out when you're finished, and use it as a projectile. I it's remember, great. I remember actually talking to someone when, uh, just not long after the game's release, and he was like, okay, but why would you use the the energy shield over the, the turret? And I was like, no, oh, you have no idea. Yeah, <laughs> especially when... Especially when I feel like, even like in 2016, it was so hard to justify, I feel for a lot of people, why do we even use the chain gun, especially over like the heavy cannon and its alt fires. Mm. And and I know with some people I talked about it, when they were playing Eternal, they still struggled to find any real reason to use the chain gun in, uh, as opposed to the heavy cannon. Except oh, no, the, the, you, the chain you gun's through... one of my favorite weapons in Doom Eternal now, just because of yeah. the, at the very least because of the turret. Yeah, and because of like the the sort of understated fact that like big charging enemies like the Hell Knights and bigger like they they get staggered by oh, just yeah. its regular fire, which is something you kind of need if you don't want to be like I don't know like wasting microwave beam energy or like homing rockets because yeah. th those Hell Knight those fuckers are fast. Yeah, especially the the cybernetic ones 
who are just yeah, the dread knights. I hate those guys so much just because they are so relentless. And if you don't like, I, I just basically go right. Fuck this. Homing missiles yeah. everywhere. Mm -hmm. Usually because I'm like backed into a corner. So you know, like if you're not using, like I'll, I'll give them their due. It does call. It does cause you to you know mix up your your regular play styles but those they're guys, really good pressure units absolutely <laughs> yeah. you could take those out of the game and i would not be upset at all <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no no none of that it, t take out dread knights fill with more marauders i'd be happy this is the exact yes, opposite I... of what i requested please stop <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it is true. I am outing myself. I am a Marauder sympathizer. First time I played uh, the online, I was uh, Doom Guy up against two Marauders, and I was like, "Well, this oh is yeah, be fun." <laughs> See, I remember going up against like two Archviles, and I was Why like, "This is what assault enemy? feels like." What, were you <laughs> the the but anyway, place? now we are at the Evil Dead moment. Yeah, sort lots of. of lots of first person camera. Strange, creepy yeah. relatives in a basement. Mm-hmm. Severed hands that are possessed. Yeah, kind of homely but almost. Yeah. yeah, it's like just waiting for the moment where it gets even more kooky and like even more evil deady. But then... Uh, <laughs> nah, game's just going to go fuck that and turn this into a half-assed cabin sequence from RE4. Uh, right was... about now. Yeah, I was just so hoping they would, you know, embrace what they're going for because Suda's almost as big a movie nerd as fucking Kojima. Yeah, and it's like, that really is why I say this is a good demonstration of, like, one of the longer standing problems of Shadows of the Damned. It's commitment. We yeah. saw the start of it possibly committing Fuck. to a full-on homage to Evil Dead 2, and like that moment everyone remembers. Yeah. But then it only it only stops once you check over at that trap door with like the zombie peeking out, and then it turns into an even like lamer and a more uninspired version of the cabin in RE4, except it's missing. A lot of the things that made that sequence so good, you know? Like, you had Lewis with you, you had the two stories, it just made it really hard to tell whether or not there was going to be an end in sight. Yeah. And then they just bring it back again at the end for no real reason. Mm hmm. But on the plus side, after that very disappointing and confused sequence, we got another storybook. Gaul, Gaul. For nearly 14 years, his mind had been soaring miles above. But Elliot Thomas was still stuck down on Earth in the boring town of Sinchester. Sinchester. Sinster. What? It's pronounced Sinster. How do you know? My cousin's from Sinster. Don't you never mind. Keep going. <sighs> Actually, the name of a town in Britain as well. Yeah, I mean, it's Winchester. Yeah. Or Winster. Or however the fuck. <laughs> you and your British pronunciations, I swear to God. <laughs> Most of it's just done to confuse non locals. Yeah. I mean, never mind adding the U in color. I mean, like, I, I at least understand both sides of that, but. On his left. Mother, Let's at least enjoy the, the fact the that Garcia is not the best, like, oral, like, storyteller. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if it's because he's just bad at reading or if he's bad at reading English. The most fascinating personality <laughs> Gonna say a little bit of both. Yeah. Doesn't seem like a natural reader to me. Nah. Justin Schmuckowski threw a crappy paper airplane at him. Within seconds, Elliot had built a superior vessel. He stood up on his chair and swiftly launched the Papier Flieger. What? At his unsuspecting <laughs> enemy. <laughs> like, this just makes me wonder now. Like, 
like there the like I know there's like Paper the anecdote of how like Lord Garcia used to have a different voice actor before focus testers told Suda that they Mr. needed someone Thomas else with like not as authentic of like a Spanish or Mexican Mr. accent or whatever Thomas. it was like it, and replace it with Steve Bloom. I want to know if there was ever a take of like this storybook reading with the original voice actor and how like endearingly awkward that also was. Like if it was more or less than what Steve Bloom is doing. <laughs> yeah. Cause the thing is like, it sounds authentic with like the confusion and the, the halting um, yeah. reading uh, pattern. Yeah, just the very awkward like pacing and dictation on uncertain sounds and words. Yeah, like, it's, it's, it's just too good. Yeah, which, which makes me think that because like they had a voice actor that was, you know, like had the actual accent Hmm. Like, that would probably would add even more authenticity to the idea of, like, well, I'm not used to reading, like, this kind of English storybook with these words that uh, that I don't even say normally. Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck, indeed. <laughs> even better than Johnson's. But yeah, this is the crossover where apparently the boy that gave the candy to George was Elliot. <laughs> It's like Star Wars. Everyone knows each other. Yep. It's like poetry at marriage. You know. <laughs> Except the Sisters Grimm. I'm pretty sure that who they were in their previous life, they didn't know these two. Yeah. Can't remember off the top of my head. I mean, it's more hilarious once we actually get to the story, just because yeah. it feels the most like a Final Destination. Just everything, <laughs> the powers that be, fucking hates them. <laughs> To the school. Call, call. He bounded through the halls, zigzagged up the stairwell. Call. The school let out a collective gasp when they saw a stinky crow on the roof with a triumphant snap. <laughs> he spread his wings, <laughs> and a moment later, he had leapt. I'm also thinking they might have like decided on Garcia being the one to read this just because they knew like the accent would make Stinky Crow like sound even more hilarious. <laughs> yeah, a bit of Ren and Stimpy in there. Yeah. Unfortunately, gravity is a harsh mistress. Yep. White beats of Elliot off sobbing students. And the police struggled to piece together the story you are reading now. Elliot's teacher looked down at the wreckage of the boy on the pavement and never forgot what he saw. One bloody hand had formed a peace sign. The other was giving him the finger. Like an Atlantis and depending on what region you're in... <laughs> You know, it's up to you to decide, like, if either or or both are rude gestures. Yep. Yeah, either way, he, he that did. Is, that is such a Suda51 thing. The, yeah. The, the simultaneous peace and fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> and the fact that the backhand peace sign is, like, just as offensive. Yep. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's Stinky Crow. As you can imagine, based on the storybook we found of George earlier in the game, we are going to have our have our encounter with Stinky Crow momentarily. Which is a shame that we did not actually get to see him at any point prior to this story, because I mean, like, they gave enough screen time to George that, that we had two fights with him. Yeah, there's there is a character a bit later on. I think it might actually be in this chapter, who you would have thought might have been a. Uh, better candidate for boss just because we get to see him yeah. more often um but yeah, yeah stinky crow's just kind of hi we needed another character here he is mm -hmm. but now we got another chase look there's a key we'd better kill all the demons in case they've got more uh this section is annoying yeah, admittedly this was like the first actual death that I had in the game, funny enough. Yeah, same I think. 
yeah. But, you know, like, if there's any good reason for, like, me being, like, not as professional or clean, like, with, like, my gameplay recordings, is that you do, will get to see some standout uh, game over sections like this. Yeah. Some of the, the deaths in this are pretty decent, to be fair. Um, yeah. Like so. Womp womp. Yeah. Only thing it was possibly missing was Johnson just flopping over. <laughs> yeah. That that would have been a nice touch. Yeah. I mean, they already have, like, the animation, sort of. Like, every time you come out of the darkness, like, when it's been draining your health, like, he's just completely flopped over. <laughs> yeah, this was the guy I was talking about. Yeah. He's the kind of guy that, you know, would have actually been nice to have in that piss-poor cabin sequence. Yep. Why do I get the sense you and me are the same line of work? <laughs> Probably because it makes more sense to, for there to be more demon hunters than just the guy we're playing. You know, because, you know, there's never just the sole assassin in any suit of work. <laughs> Also, was yeah, he really going to try and kill him with a fucking grenade launcher in a cabin? Like, <laughs> the fuck, he man? He, he probably had a dud ready that wasn't even going to explode. Just give him a mighty concussion. Hard like hard. Experienced. Just forget it. Don't think I ever will. Yeah, this character is also, like, I think, like, the second major problem that it represents within the same video. Like, the Evil Dead cabin was already, like, the gameplay problem it was representing. This is like a clear representation of a story problem in that compared to like other Suda's works, like like any person that looks like it would be a major side character that isn't the protagonist or antagonist or the object of like the protagonist like goals. Like they at least have something of interest that is like worth diving into more than like what you immediately see on the surface. We're not yeah. going to see much more of that guy, except for, like, two cutscenes. And one of those is, like, posthumous. <laughs> yeah, he's he's going to die. This game doesn't give a shit. Yeah. And besides which, it's a side character in a Suda51 game. They're either going to wind up horribly mutilated, or they're just going to walk out of the plot. Yeah. And in this case, it's the former, but without much in the way of, like any sort of satisfying like resolution yeah so that it gives you the impression that he could be some kind of rival or that you like the the virgil to your dante yeah or the jean to your bayonetta and yeah no nah, nothing like that yeah like the most that they give is that he is ostensibly in the underworld but per pursuing a similar goal to what garcia is which is he's like after someone in this case we're after fleming here he, like as that sort of like wanted poster described like he's after a particular demon that like killed his lover yeah which you know like if that was a running theme like that suda wanted to elaborate on more i imagine there probably we probably would have had more run-ins with other demon hunters that might have been brought here for like similar purposes and you know and seeing them either fall or just leave the plot unentirely, like, elsewhere would serve as a good way to kind of, like, contrast or flesh out, like, Garcia's motivations. Yeah, could have done the Devil May Cry thing where that's where we get our additional weapons from. Garcia. Yeah. Onion? I found you at last. My love. I want to hold you. Um... <laughs> Might want to raise your head what? either a whole length higher or lower. <laughs> no, no. Oh, also, don't just fucking Help stand me. there. Help me, Garcia! <laughs> Hold on, Paula! Why? I will go to the store and buy you some Tampax. <laughs> Going to need an entire case of them. Johnson just whispering in, ear, in his ear. That's just fucked, G. <laughs> Man, just not the time right now. Not the time. How long must I suffer? I 
just want to give up and die. Until we hit the credits, Paula, I'm, I'm sorry. It'll be a few more hours. <laughs> I swear I'm coming. Garcia. Dude, it's a head, not a telephone. <laughs> Fuck! <laughs> There's Stinky Crow. Dickwad! Fuck yeah! Out of my way! This one's mine. Hey. So yeah, our big burly guy has a vendetta against Stinky Crow. Who could have possibly seen that coming? Also, that's not how grenade launchers fucking work. They no. shoot grenades, not bullets. <laughs> I think someone in the crew kind of mistook a semi-auto grenade launcher for a Tommy gun. Yeah. Did not realize the difference between like a rotating grenade barrel and a drum barrel. They they both have barrels. It's it's the same thing, you know, like using yeah. a nine millimeter bullet and a revolver. Yeah, just show this to any gun nut, and they're just gonna have a brain aneurysm. Oh, I really pissed one off by by talking about uh, putting shotgun bullets in a clip. <laughs> oh. God, he fucked. went apoplectic. He was like, I know you don't have guns in the UK, but please tell me you're not really that stupid. And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> could I, you could hear his head bouncing off the table an entire continent away. It was great. Here I come, fucker! That is really poor trigger discipline. Mm-hmm. Also, that technically wasn't a boss that we fought, but we still get a weapon upgrade anyway. <laughs> I'm ready for insertion. Damn it, Johnson. Trying to keep this classy. <laughs> uh, I'm trying. Skullfest 9000! Swear it looks like some kind of kitchen implement. Yeah. Like Hell's or Egg the Whisk. Most, or the most... Yeah, it, it yeah, it looks like a demonic egg whisk or a fucking like metal as hell branding iron. Yeah. But yes, the skull fest. Um this uh this one we can uh hold down the fire button to load up all four shots to release at once. It's actually pretty neat. Yeah, this is sort of your rocket launcher for the game now. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. And there's one more upgrade for this that I guess the best analog he could give is maybe like a like a grenade launcher, but not like contact grenades. Yeah. That's the best way to the, describe the final upgrade. Yeah, it's just kind of weird that it goes from rocket launcher to grenade rather than the other way around. You'd expect that to be the more the natural progression. Or maybe it's just me. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Yeah, especially when you think about how, like, Quake 1 introduces the grenades first before you ever get the rocket launcher. Yep. But unlike Quake 1, like, the grenade launcher equivalent of this game is not nearly as fun. No. <laughs> doesn't have Barely that, anything. Doesn't have that melodic doink, 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 doink. Yeah. It's like, only other place you can think of that'll give you, like, the most um, satisfaction with, like, chaotic grenade play is Team Fortress. Um, but, but, I, no, but but I sure as hell don't want to play TF2 anymore. I oh, have my no. time with it. No. Back when we used to play Halo 2, it always uh, everyone was always like, you know, uh, MLG, Pro Strats, this is how we play it. And then it's me, and it's like, let's just play on a small Posers. map with grenades everywhere. Yeah. Everyone hated it, but I'm just having the most fun. You are that one Smash player who does not like the no rules Final Destination setup because you just love chaos. I demand randomness when I'm playing yes. those kind of games, and everyone I'm actually the hates same it. way. <laughs> I will always, I will always vote for the most bullshit, like random ass maps ever. Yep. And all items on. Bitch. Are you kidding? That guy was nearly indestructible. See so yeah, that hunter, uh, he just got himself killed off screen. <laughs> Good job, dickhead. See what's left of him. He was indestructible. We can tell that from the twelve sentences he shared with us. Yeah. 
So now we gotta finish off Stinky Crow for real. The thing I dislike most about Stinky Crow, especially compared to George, like, George's interesting aspect was that he had this harmonica in his throat, but this is like, the only words he has in his vocabulary is fuck you. Yeah, and like, he screams it like he's in fucking Dragon Ball Z. Yeah, like, you can't even come up with anything, like, more creative to insult me with. Like, like not even a your mother sucks cocks in hell. You can't even, like, muster up that much. But at least his final form is pretty apt for his, uh, for his particular name. Yep. Giant Crow, who Before probably stinks like shit. <laughs> That name is Garcia fucking Hotspur. There's that Hell full yeah. of <laughs> like you. Oh, yes. This is a pretty alright fight. I do think I like it more than either of the George encounters. Yeah. Like, it's... It's, it's an interesting sort of thing to, like, look at when this is like a you know, a giant-sized boss fight. And it's something that I realized between all the years that I've played games like Devil May Cry and, like, other character action games and then compare with, like, other shooters like Doom Eternal recently, is that these type of giant boss fights really do make more sense when you're in a game that encourages you to use guns. Hmm. Like, they're always, they're always terrible when they show up in something like uh, Devil May Cry or Ninja Guy and their Bayonetta just because of how big the melee focus is. Yeah. And when you only have that, it's a lot harder to control the pace how you want. And I mean, this fight is basically Griffin from the first Double May Cry all over again. Yeah, but without the need to, like, you know, knock it down uh, to, like, uh, melee its core. And even then, like, most of the Griffin encounters, you could just, like, just grenade roll spam to, to whittle it down or like use air raid with the uh, Alistair's devil trigger hmm. it's been ages since I played it so I genuinely don't remember much about the, um, the first devil may cry funnily enough last I remember playing it was about two years ago when the HD collection came out on PC hmm. and I used that as my opportunity to finally get through the game on Dante Must Die which was a deal. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, my my neck beard is not luxurious enough to play any of the the games on Dante Must Die. I don't hate myself that much. I only really had the energy to go through DMD mode on Devil May Cry One just because of how different in priorities the gameplay feels compared at a high level compared to what the series became with Three onward. Mm. Because it's like, let's see, trying to put this. I feel like there's, despite like the kind of like the advertising of that game being stylish, hard action, a lot of the way that like enemies are designed and the use of your different weapons and abilities is like, it, it there's very little fluff in, in, in like in terms of like moves that exist purely for style and not of not much practicality. And mm. the enemies all encourage you to make use of, like, every single one of your tools in some way. Yeah. L like, you come ac across the frost late in the game, like, you know that it's made for you to just wail on them with Ifrit. Mm-hmm. And it works thematically as well, since it's a fire enemy versus, uh, sorry, a fire skill versus uh, an ice enemy. So, yeah. even if you've played any games whatsoever, you'd probably be able to work that out fairly swiftly. Yeah. Like, man, even now, with as good as Devil May Cry 5 is, they really still have not been able to get to the same level of quality with enemy design like that first game did. Mm. And, I, like, the hard part about it, I imagine, is because of the fact that, like, some of DMC 1's design goals are clearly no longer the same as what modern DMC is. But for God's sake, there's like a lot more that could be done with the uh, with those games in 5 especially, of just having enemies that do more to like 
get you out of the air because that's usually where you're a lot safer or just all around better enemy aggression. I think as well is the with four and five you've got the devil bringer which means the any enemy that tries to get away from you nope back here yeah which don't get me wrong i absolutely love the devil bringer and it's one of my favorite mechanics from any kind of uh action game in the last what decade but yeah, it, do it is very easy to abuse it yeah, but but even then, that's that's just for Nero. That's not even getting to just how busted Dante is at all times. Oh yeah, but in his case, you can kind of um, sort of forgive it because he is that badass a character. So it, yeah. it, thematically, it makes sense for him just to be so overpowered. Mhm. Mm so that was our Devil May Cry Five discussion panel featuring Shadows of the Damn Boss fight that we completely like stopped talking about after a point because it was self-explanatory. Yeah. <laughs> what what more could we really say? Let's be honest. Hey, yeah. Take a closer look at that billboard over there. Unfortunately, after that pretty all right boss fight, next time we come around, it's gonna be not good. Oh What's that? Only the hottest hostess club in the underworld, G. The honeys there used to give the most lovely jobs before I fucked them in their sockets. <laughs> of course, this is when I still have fleshy parts. Johnson, that's sick. Just get TMI. me to bone. This boner needs a booster. Now nope, nope, we are not going to be boosting your boner for any in. reason because we have something more important to do. So this has been a great LP. I'm just going to duck out now because this entire <laughs> section makes me want to eat my own face off. Ugh. You this. mean face off. <laughs> Please tell me that you went and did the face off hand no. gesture on your own. Oh, you, you know I did. Yep, I did as well. Y you can't help <laughs> but. Speaking of buts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's a 2D butt, actually. Like, that's just a giant cardboard stand. <laughs> yeah, all subtlety gone straight into the wood chipper. Yeah. We're going to have more to say about the big boner uh, next boy, video. <laughs> this, is yeah. the, this is the point that made me quit the game for about three years. Isn't that fun? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. Let's move on to something more positive. Let's move on back to Kuriyami Dance. As we're at the start of a brand new volume. <laughs> start of a new day. Yep. Yeah, I do want to at least want to point out uh, just how nice looking like the uh, like the volume covers are for this manga, especially when as we've gone to the second, like you know, like there is some very clear stuff being demonstrated that we are going to see uh, as we continue Kaido's journey through this fucked up kingdom. Yep, Suda does love his uh, women in white, c smothered in blood. Yeah, it's, I mean, like that. It's an effective kind of uh, imagery. For, yep, for it definitely life. stands out. Mhm. Mm so let's move on to chapter seven, Challenger. Bada bum. So yeah, as you probably remember from last time, uh. Kaido got hit with a trank dart that caused his truck to careen off a ledge and, and is now hanging by like an, uh, by a by like a branch <laughs> on the underside, as a whole host of different parties are all tracking his progress and trying to fuck him up in some way. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. Yes. Meanwhile, ba back at the back at the old town, uh, Kenjin. Uh, Kaido's best friend, who we've not seen ever since he uh, he left at the end of chapter two, suddenly like feels an intense pressure. I feel I guess only a new type would would understand. Zawa. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's what like the katakana like sound effects are saying, but I feel like that's a missed opportunity now. Yeah, I was I, I was watching uh, Kaiji again recently, and you know everyone does the the Jojo's Bizarre Adventure one, but I prefer yeah. the classics. Mm-hmm. So yeah, he... Yeah, Kenjin 
gets a horrible flash that something's happening to Kaido and proceeds to do something, but uh, we don't see what it is he actually does. As we cut back to the action, as the old lady uh, that we met on the train uh, uh, like ordered the train guards specifically for the purpose of apprehending Kaido alive for whatever reason. And the Lolita is just kind of stuck not doing anything except uh, messaging, I guess, Killer17 line stamps. Why don't we have those? Those would be so cool. I know. It looks so good. <laughs> I'd just be sending ones a con to everyone and people going, why is, why is the small child swearing so much? <laughs> what is wrong with you? This is, this is degeneracy of a minor. It, ju it just sent like a stamp of like Kunlan and it says, it's Friday night. <laughs> yes, Friday night. Oh no, wait, that's a different one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just to, uh, okay, just to break uh, like away from it uh, briefly. I love how there are now like two like dumb single purpose like Twitter accounts that exist solely for reposting out of context scenes from Suda's games. And another that is just for retweeting like the scene with Kunlan and Harm uh, and Har uh, Harman, like at the end of the first mission when he goes, "It's Friday night." <laughs> See, I was thinking of the the Yakuza one. It's Friday. Yeah, that one. Yes, that one's good Friday. too. <laughs> bam, 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 bam. <laughs> yeah, but I just like the Kunlan one more just because of how simultaneously silly and sinister it is, given that character. <laughs> But yes, the but yes, the man that shot Kaido heads out now with a pair of nunchucks, with not much else. I you would think that he would bring like a rope ladder or something just to pull Kaido out of there, but or, or at least he, a very big saw so he can cut him down and retrieve the corpse. Ex yeah, but then of course that'd be uh, causing a problem of him no longer being alive, and he was explicitly told not to kill him. <laughs> but that doesn't matter because. Uh, just random car out of nowhere rams into him and out pops a sh shotgun toting lady with an eye patch. We are already at best character of the story right here. I'm I'm more invested at this moment now than I have been in the previous 250 pages. Yeah. We, we found our he we found our heroine, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Yeah. To get in, she gets into a little uh, scuffle with the with the old man. Fires, fires a shotgun, he deflects them <laughs> as if he were Mirai at the beginning of Ninja Gaiden 1. <laughs> and you just know he's you just know he's making the, the, the Bruce Lee noises as he's doing it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I imagine that totally would be the case like in a Ninja Gaiden game. Like if you had like if someone had nunchucks and someone was like firing automatic weapons at him, you know full well that he would deflect every single bullet. Oh, absolutely. Never mind how impossible that would be. <laughs> so yeah, as the, but as this fight is happening, Kaido finally awake, uh, uh, wakes up, realizes shit's going on. the The old man uh, is gotten rid of, and then the lady, uh, somewhat directly and kind of rudely, asks Kaido if he needs help. Yeah, a bit of a nightmare before Christmas homage going on there as well. Yeah, yeah, the hill, like, the way it's curved definitely does kind of, uh, lead to that. But this whole exchange is incredibly awkward for, <laughs> I'd say both parties, but I feel like the awkwardness is more on Kaido's end just because he has no idea how to deal with, like, this girl's attitude. <laughs> yeah, it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's like, I'll do you a favor. What kind of favor? Shut up, I'll tell you the favor first. It's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> Uh, I'm less inclined to help you now that you're asking questions. Okay, okay, okay! Yep. But then the twig breaks, uh, in a sort of light... Uh, instead of the light flashing before his eyes during this, he recedes into another corner of his mind where he and Chalia are cooped up on a Ferris wheel. <laughs> and, and then he complains that he's shit. never gotten laid. Yep. Even answering the hard question following that, that of, you know, are you gay? But turns out, no. Now, arms are cool. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but then, of course, 
the most important question gets asked. Is he a fan of Gundam? Not much else really needs to be said, I suppose. <laughs> like, you read this, and if you're already, like, familiar with, like, you see Era Gundam, like, everything's kind of clicking in your head. Like, yep, yep. Yeah, I, I had to look this up because I'm not too familiar with the, the older stuff. Um, Me neither. Like, I've, I've more or less absorbed, like, the major parts of, like, original Gundam, like, through osmosis, just because I yep. kind of... My my preferences for for how I like my real robots like anime or media to be kind of conflicts with what Gundam's kind of always had even since the beginning mm. but uh, the, the Bra Bro which I'm not even sure if that's how it's pronounced is one of the Xeon super weapons when they just said fuck it and started building gigantic mechs the size of small moons um, yeah. And naturally, it got blown up in like 30 seconds because, you know, Xeon. And, yeah. Uh, Charlie Abul was the pilot or main pilot. I'm not sure if it had more than one of the Brabro. Mm hmm. So that's Which that is how you, Yep. And that's how you know now where Charlie's name comes from yep. and why and, we have been using it. Just because, you know, sometimes it's nice just to have a proper name. For some of these characters, even if they're kind of not getting one for a while, except insults like shit brain. Yeah, and uh, that dude in the, with the beard, uh, with the mustache in the top left corner, is uh, Charlie Abul. Yep, indeed it is. But then this uh, this like lengthy discussions cut short, as while midfall, uh, the woman. Uh, very quickly and effortlessly throws down a tow hook that miraculously latches on to Kaido's truck and then pulls it back up. Yeah, also bolts it on because I don't think it was on the... Like, when she was standing on the top of the car, you could even see that there was a tow, uh, a tow hook on yeah. there. Yeah, uh, time is... Yeah, time operates however it feels like. Not to mention, those things are fucking heavy and awkward as hell. Yeah, which probably says a lot about like how tough this girl is and why and, and you know why you should be totally respectful <laughs> never I'll... mind the shotgun she could probably just like crush your head with a, just between her uh, between her biceps or something unfortunately it turns out she likes lock on stratus and then ruins everything forever <laughs> oh dear <laughs> that's gonna kick start zone debate Ah, oh well. <laughs> but yes, Kaido gets uh, Kaido gets saved, and then like as thanks, takes it to the Kuragani drive-in for some food and tea, which is much classier inside than the term drive-in would suggest. Yeah, I mean like they're, I mean they're, they straight up like got out of their car for this, so it's like a, it's it's just more like a, just a straight up restaurant. A very very classy restaurant as well. Mm hmm. Yeah, and so more awkward discussions continue between the two, and uh, it it leads to a point where the girl's clearly had enough of, of Kaido and his questions that she just goes, right, fuck this, I'm leaving. He does not pick up on any hints, which is fair because her hints are cryptic as fuck. Yeah, including the part where she just comes back. Miraculously. <laughs> and another to, thing. <laughs> yeah, because according to her, our real man would have followed me. Well, I don't know. When, I, when a woman says, fuck this, I'm gone, I usually kind of go, okay then. Maybe it's just mm -hmm. me being disrespectful. Yep. Yeah, this is... Yeah, the, the chemistry between these two is... Especially weird, and like what, uh, and what transpires between them as as we go on becomes even more baffling after what we have just seen with him not picking up the hints, and now him just like shyly apologizing for for not picking up on any of like the things that she was trying to get across. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I promise. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, and this gets even more awkward when uh, 
he notes that this woman in particular uh, looks a, uh, looks like a specific actress, a Kasumi uh, Kasumi uh, Arimura. Yes, thank you. Like I, I, like I, I've been looking at this on my monitor, but like some of the text, like, is a bit too small for me to see without zooming in or <laughs> just like pressing my face against. But this, uh, yeah, th- yeah, this kind of appears to rub the g- uh, girl a long way when she realizes that she's being compared to an actress. <laughs> You look like you look like a really pretty actress. Really? Fuck you. Because you're right. <laughs> well, that may be so, but you're comparing me to someone, so fuck you. <laughs> yeah, it's like yeah, it's after this point in particular that like her entire demeanor changes in a very bizarre way cuz it's like she, at the end, she's ultimately thankful for the compliment. It's like, I'll forgive you for being a dumbass. Let's go to the Union Hotel. <laughs> I'd be lying if I said this wasn't pretty closely following my last few uh, friendships with women. <laughs> Did those also include them just like on the spot deciding, hey, let's get married? No, but because they Because that's what she's to- doing. No, but at some point, shotguns were involved. Ah. Yeah. And then, as if to make this even more bizarre, especially to Charlie's chagrin, Kaido agrees. <laughs> On the married part, specifically. <laughs> you know what? We've only we've only known each other literally about ten minutes. Let's get married. Yeah. I've never been more happy. Yes, you yeah, can you, like... you can tell by his inability to crack a smile. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or maybe unwillingness. It's hard to tell at this point. Who knows, but I I would at least be able to, like, forgive him for making that quick decision when you consider the fact that this woman, like, has an eye patch, carries a shotgun, and is probably super physically tough. And also more than likely a fan of Mad Max if the V6 charger is anything to go by. Yeah, I'd be mean, like, shit, she's the keeper. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You, you do not but want to it. let quality like that get away from you. Yep. Final panel. The the two of them are getting ready to head off. Uh, check back in with Kenjin. And I'm guessing based on everything that had happened here, the implication was that he somehow possibly called on, on the woman to help Kaido out in the bind. It's but, like Dragon Ball with yeah. shotguns. Instead of giving mm-hmm. him his energy, he sent him a woman with one eye. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. that's how that works, I think. It's been a while since I've watched Dragon Ball as well. Yeah. But that, but that's it for the chapter. Our next destination, as has been uh, highlighted, is the Union Hotel, but um it 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 still feels more accurate to me to like call it the flower, sun and rain. <laughs> or uh the setting for the finale of Killer Seven. Well, one of the finales of Killer Seven. Yeah. Because it's like I mean, ten. Yeah, yeah, that that that, that is true. But Flowers on the Rain is like way more apt when you kind of see some of the mind game shenanigans that take place, so like in in this in this uh, area. Oh yeah, shit's yeah, about to get it's... wacky. It is, and because of all the Flower, Sun, and Rain mentions, I can safely say that when you see what it's like at the Union Hotel. You could probably imagine that the best type of game to like represent Kuriyami Dance, if it were, if it had ever become an actual game, it would probably be something like more resembling the head of Flower, Sun, and Rain. Yeah. Or at least, or at least just like that kind of three D adventure game that is all walking. Yeah. So like a cross between Flower, Sun, and Rain and Killer Seven. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But um, you know, obviously, you wouldn't be like dealing with invisible suicide bombers and, and other shit and at least have a bit more freedom to like move around instead of just holding a button to go on a rail <laughs> maybe a smidge but not too much because you don't want your players to get complacent yeah it, it'll be fun <laughs> quote unquote fun <laughs>